Hare Krishna. So today is the festival of Jagannath Mishra, the day when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Nibai's birth was celebrated by his parents. So I'll draw from this Bhagavatam verse and broadly I'll speak on the theme of parallels between Gaur Lila and Krishna Lila and largely parallel in the theme of protection. So here in this particular verse, it is said that Dwaraka was protected. Now the context is that Krishna has come back from Astinapur to Dwarka, which is the place where he is residing currently. And the residents of Dwarka welcomed him with words of great respect and affection, permeated with intense bhava. And then the Lord enters in. The next several verses will be describing the glory of Dwarka. So, Dwarka by its very name is was a fortress and Dwarka, where is the door? It was such an impregnable fortress. Dwar means door. Ka means where. So where is the door? It was such an impregnable fortress that for, for invaders, there's just no way they could enter. And we know originally, because Krishna was repeatedly, Krishna's king, when Krishna was living in Mathura, he was repeatedly attacked by Jarasandh. And Krishna defeated him every time, but he felt that the attack disturbed the Mathuravas, and especially the attack disturbed the Vrajavasis. Because when Jarasanth came from Magad, on the way from Magad to Mathura was Vrindavan. So Jiva Goswami says in Gopal Champu that each time the Vrajavasis had to leave their homes and take refuge in the nearby forests. So, of course, Jarasanth didn't uh, plunder Vrindavan because for him Vrindavan was very small and insignificant. His goal was Krishna and the wealth of Mathura. But Krishna eventually felt that he wanted to protect the Mathuravasis and the Vrajivasis. So he transported the Mathuravasis to another place, Dwarka, and it was quite far, almost the other end of the country, so that any invaders there would not in any way travel the Vrajivasis. So, the place of Dwarka was very well protected. And it's interesting here that Atmutulya, which is said that, that, all, that, that there are many great warriors from different dynasties, they were as powerful as Krishna. Now, normally it is said Asamurdhva, that the absolute truth is, has no equals, is no one equal to him, not to speak, what to speak of, or greater than him. So, what does it mean when it is said over here that these are Atmatulya? Now, even their names are not mentioned specifically. They said that the descendants of these dynasties were as powerful as Krishna, as good as him. So, now, <clears throat> there are rhetorical ways of saying things which are not meant to be taken literally. Say, for example, when we say that Trividham Narkasedam Dwaram Nashanam Atmana. There are three gates to hell and they destroy the soul. So 16.21 in the Bhagavad Gita. Now, one of the fundamental characters of the soul is Abhinashi Tutadvidhi. That the soul is indestructible. The soul is indestructible. If the soul is Abhinashi, then how can be Atmanash? Dwaram Nashanam Atmana. So this Nasha is non literal. The point is that what is destroyed is the spirituality of the soul, not the soul itself. The spiritual consciousness, the spiritual inclination, the spiritual interest is all destroyed by lust, anger and greed. So the context makes it clear. This is a standard principle in Mimamsa, which is, which is Mimamsa is a school of thought which is elaborately talked about how scripture is to be studied. And they say where the literal meaning does not make sense, it's understood that the, there is some other meaning going on over there. So standard example is, if you say he lives on the river or that house is on the river. Now obviously a house cannot be on the river. It means it's on the banks of the river. So like that here, Atmatulya is not meant in the literal sense that they are equal to God. But in the sense that there is no inadequacy in the protection of Dwarka in the absence of Krishna. So just as Krishna could protect them. So similarly, the 
Warriors could also protect them. It's not that they were omnipotent. It's not that they could show the Vishwa Rupa. But in terms of martial defense, if you see the overall context that is going on, is it's protection. Just as Krishna could protect, they could also protect. So as far as protection was concerned, see here they have to see the context. The context is the, the glory and the opulence of Dwarka is being described. And the point is that if there is a powerful kingdom, one of the characteristics of a powerful kingdom is not just the wealth it has, the big towers it has, but also the warriors that it has. So if Krishna is the only sole protector over there, if Krishna is not there, any enemy can come and ransack. Then you may say, okay, it's a good kingdom, but not so great. So if a great a kingdom's greatness is seen not just by the greatness of the leaders, but the greatness of other people also in the kingdom. Not just the main leader, but the other leaders in the kingdom also. So Atmatulya is not in literal equality. It is in terms of the potency of protection. That is the, that is the theme over here. So in terms of protecting Dwarka, there were many warriors who were very competent for protecting Dwarka. No one is equal to the Lord in the absolute sense. But in this particular sense, they could be equal. So, now in scripture often metaphors are given and those metaphors, if we do not have a proper context, they may be very difficult for us to understand. So, for us, in each culture there might be some metaphors. So, say somebody comes from India and somebody, or somebody comes to India from say a place like Africa where people don't even know much about cricket. I said, this person is as this this person is as famous as this cricketer. Now, first people who think cricket is an insect, you know, for them that reference will not make any sense only. What do you mean? That is a cricketer. Cricketer means the one who takes care of crickets. <laughs> what is a cricketer? <laughs> so every culture provides a context, and naturally, while speaking in that culture, certain examples, certain metaphors are naturally drawn from that context. But uh, outside that context, it may not make sense. So now, when we are studying the Bhagavatam thousands of years later, now we may not even know about what is Bhogavati. We don't know what is Nagaloka. We don't even know okay how the Nagaloka is protected. But at that time, it was understood that Nagaloka is a very formidable place. There are Sarpas and Nagas. Krishna talks about them as different in the, uh, in the, in the Bhagavad Gita 10 chapter. He says, Na among, Nag among Sarpas, among the snakes, I am Vasuki. And among Nagas, I am Ananta. So the difference, Baldev Devajan explains, s s there are many normal snakes, but Nagas are snakes with hooves. They are considered uh, special. Not just special in terms of, uh, they can be very powerful, but they are also considered auspicious in some ways. There are many places in India where Nagas are worshipped. So snakes which have hooves are worshipped. So, in the especially in South India. Now of course it is devolved, so even ordinary snakes are worshipped because people don't find Nagas, so they start worshipping snakes also. <laughs> but <laughs> the idea is, Nagas were what were worshipped. So, na so, Naga so snakes are considered envious, but Nagas are considered auspicious. And if a Naga is present, people, when it, no, people see a snake, they will run away. Almost everyone will run away. And when somebody sees a Naga, people will offer respects. People may offer some milk or some respects. So the idea is, Naga, Naga Loka is... Um, Naga Loka is something which is considered to be a, a part of the celestial world. There is the terrestrial world where we live, the celestial is the where the devatas live, and there is the subterranean world. So although the Nagaloka is situated below, but still it is not considered exactly like a demoniac place. It's considered that Nagas are also auspicious people. And now of course there is some simplistic linguistic correlation that is done, which really does not stand much uh, critical historical scrutiny. Like some people say Australia is Astrale. This was a place where the Pandavas stored their weapons. Now, this is not at all, there's no linguistic correlation like that, literally. Similarly, some say Nagaloka is Nagaland. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nagaland is a state in India. So, this sort of correlation, some devotees may do it and it might, it might appeal to some people. 
But historical scrutiny or literally linguistic historical scrutiny, if we do, we find that that may not stand so much scrutiny. So Naga Loka is, it exists at a different level. It's got nothing to do with Naga land. Although there might be some correlation in terms of that in that particular place, maybe snakes were worshipped, Nagas were worshipped a lot and sometime in the past. But uh, <coughs> if, you, if the level of serious scholarship, it doesn't really stand scrutiny. But the point here is, that Krishna is, the, the Bhagavatam is saying Dwarka was well protected. And for that, the names of the warriors are given and another example is given of a city that was well protected and was known to be well protected in that cultural context. So for us, if we consider the theme of the Lord's protection, Krishna, when he protects, how does he protect? So, Kunti Maharani talks about various reasons why Krishna descends in her prayers in the 8th chapter of the first canto, which is 3 chapters before this. And she lists various reasons. First she says, okay, actually, some people say that you came to glorify Kechitahura Jamjatam Punnishlokasya Kirtaye Yado Priyasan Vivaye Malayas Ivachandanam He says that some people say this, you come because you want to glorify the pious kings. Some people say you come to destroy the envious. So pious kings mean you came to glorify Yudhishthir and prove to the world how glorious he is. Some people say you came to destroy envious people like Kamsa and protect your parents. Some people say that actually you come to lower the burden of the earth. And she gives like that. Apareva sudevasya deva kyamya chito abhyagad. She gives various reasons like that. And then she gives a concluding reason. She does not necessarily say this is the true and that is false. She says, basically says, some people say this, some people say this, some people say this. And bhavesmin kleshamana klishyamana nam avidya kama karma bhi shravan smaran arhani karishyan itike chana. And some people say this is the last reason she gives. That she says that you come to perform pastimes in this world and by performing pastimes for subsequent generations you give substance to hear about to remember about and that hearing and remembering about you is the means to rise above material consciousness to come out of the material world bhavesmin klishyamananam bhava asmin in this world there are many distresses klishyamananam Avidya Kama Karma Bhi, Prabhupada says that these three words summarize the whole of material existence. He says minimum words, maximum wisdom. Avidya Kama Karma Bhi. Because of ignorance, we have worldly desires, Kama. And because of worldly desires, Karma, we engage in worldly activities. And that leads to Klishyamana, Naam, distress. So Avidya Kama Karma Bhi. But this is removed. Our karmic bondage is stopped. Our Kama is purified and avidya is removed. Our ignorance is removed, our worldly desires are purified. Our worldly activities are also spiritualized. How? If we hear about Krishna and understand that he is our ultimate goal. Shravan Smarana Arhani Krishnaiti Kechana. So for giving us food to hear about. Now, we all face various dangers in life. And... <clears throat> Uh, there are, there are even materially, there can be dangers, there can be job insecurity, there can be, there can be diseases infecting anyone at any time, there can be accidents happening, there can be terrorist attacks, there can be various kinds of dangers at the physical level and there can be dangers in terms of temptations for us as seekers. So ultimately at the material world, at the material level, the protection that we seek is for our consciousness. And the protection for our consciousness comes by having an absor absorbing object for our consciousness. The body, yes, we, as much as possible, we do need to protect it. But the body cannot be ultimately protected because it is going to grow old, get diseased and die. So the body is a vehicle for consciousness. And just like if we are driving a car, if we are driving a car to some particular destination, then, say, or if we are driving some senior devotee, then we will drive carefully. But if there is an accident, then what we will try to do is we will try to minimize the damage to the living people over there. Say, 
if if somebody is sitting behind us, we are talking at a car, car and some truck comes and hits from the opposite side. Then we will turn the car around so that the truck hits the other side, not the side where we are sitting or the other person is sitting. So the, the car is important, but more important than the car is the person in the car. So both need to be protected, but comparatively speaking, more important is to protect the person. So similarly, the body needs to be protected. The body's needs have to be taken care of. But if there's a choice between the body and the soul, the soul's protection is most important. And Krishna does protect us at the bodily level also. But Krishna's primary protection is at the level of the soul, at the level of consciousness. So Krishna protects us primarily by giving us a satisfying object for consciousness. What is the satisfying object? His own rich pastimes. His own pastimes which are filled with such spiritual emotion with such spiritual which profound meaning permeated with love that we can become attracted to them and thus we can become absorbed in them and that uh, facility for absorption that he provides us that is his greatest benediction so with that mood that absorption in krishna's pastime absorption in krishna's purpose krishna's service krishna's mission that is the ultimate protection that krishna can offer us so with that mood, let's, let's try to absorb ourselves a little bit in, in the past times of the Lord by comparing uh, Gaur Lila and Krishna Lila. So we see in terms of appearance, both the appearance of Lord Chaitanya, of Gaura, Gaura Chandra and Krishna Chandra, both was preceded by trauma. Of course, at one level, in the appearance of Krishna, there was not just trauma, there was a threat, active threat. Kamsa was out to kill Devaki and Vasukhi. But then, he was saved, but then Kamsa brutally murdered the children of Devaki before Balram and Krishna were appeared. So now, in the case of Jagannath Mishra and Shachi Devi, there was no, no threat like that. But still, they also lost numerous children. Like I said, that they also lo lost multiple children. At that now we could say at that time infant mort mortality was very high, whatever. But some sources say six, some sources say eight. They also lost multiple children before they could have the Supreme Lord born to them. So that is also representative that the manifestation of the Lord is never easy in the world. And it's very significant, Chaitanya Charitamrut says that when they lost their children repeatedly, Jagannath Mishra and Sachidevi didn't become resentful of the resentful, but they became even more intense in their devotion. They started praying to Vishnu more and more. They started praying that let us become purified, let us have a child, a celestial child. So Whenever we want the Lord to manifest in our heart, Prabhupada compares Devki, uh, Devki's womb to be like our heart. And he says, just as the six Anarthas have to be killed, Devki's six sons had to be killed. Before, the Guru Balram could manifest and after that, Krishna could manifest. So, similarly for us, if we, on the path of progressive devotion, go through difficulties, we shouldn't become disheartened by that. It is just a part of the process. Life is tough, but bhakti can make us tougher. Life is tougher than what we think, but bhakti can make us tougher than what we think we can be. So in that way, we will face difficulty, or sometimes it may appear that bhakti itself is increasing difficulty in our life. But bhakti is also increasing our capacity to face difficulty. And by that, and just as Sachi Mata and Jagannath Mishra took more and more shelter of Bhakti of Krishna. Similarly, we also need to take more and more shelter of the Lord when we face difficulties. Then eventually, when, the, when they were there in the womb, both Krishna Chandra and Gaura Chandra, at that time, various mysterious events happened. Jagannath Mishra had a special vision, just as Nanda Maharaj had a special, just as Vasudev had a special vision. Some, some divine being is going to come. And they're all, the, the devatas came and offered their prayers. In the 10th canto, 2nd chapter, the whole chapter is Garbhastuti, before the appearance of Krishna. 
So how when Devaki had Krishna in her womb, the devatas offered prayers to Krishna. Similarly, it is described that the devatas came and the devatas came and offered prayers to Gaur Chandra also while he was there. And then eventually, when he was born, it is described that both Krishna Chandra and Gaur Chandra were very mischievous. That the forms of mischief were slightly different. Krishna would steal butter primarily, but uh, now. Gaurachandra would go to the nearby Ganga and he would play in the Ganga and he would throw water on the others and he would, just as Krishna would tease the gopis, the <coughs> Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Nimai, at that time would tease the girls who would be worshipping Lord Shiva over there. And then they would be worshipping Shiva so that they would have a good husband and he would say, I am the Lord of Shiva, I will be your husband. And they would say, what kind of blasphemy is this? You will offend the Lord. He said, no, I am not offending, I am speaking the truth. They just couldn't understand what he is doing. So, both were mischievous. Now, there is a difference significantly that Krishna was born in the Kshatriya family and then he went and stayed with Vaishyas. Nasudeva was a Kshatriya and Nanda Mahadeva was a Vaishya. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was born in the Brahmana family. And he was also mischievous, but because he's a Brahmana family, for him, learning was considered very important. Now, it's in, both of them are said to be precocious. Precocious means that they learn very quickly, very fast. So, because initially Krishna was in the Vaishya family, so in the Vaishya family, there is Diksha that happens. Generally, Brahmana, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas get Diksha. Diksha in the Vedic context was somewhat different from how it is now. Diksha is now in the Vaishnava tradition it is more like a lifelong commitment, a lifelong relationship between the guru and the disciple. In the in the past, Diksha was more of a uh, finite time of training. There is no description of say Chaitanya of Krishna's interaction with Sandipani Muni after he leaves the Guru Kul. But of course, the lessons that are learned are always there. Mm, mm, so then Krishna went to the Sandipani Muni's ashram and within a short while, he says, in 64 days he learned all that, that was to be learned. What takes years and years for people to learn, he learned very quickly. Similarly, Nimai also learned, he did not go and stay in a Gurukul, he was a Brahman, he stayed at home, he went to his, he went to Ganga Das Pandit's uh, uh, Titola, his teaching academy. And there he learned so fast. He just learned so quickly. He, within a few years, not only had he finished all learning, initially he was very mischievous. At the age of between 6 to 8, he started learning. And then by, by 14, he had his own academy. By the age of 10 or 12, he had finished all his learning. And 14, he had not only started teaching, but he had got an academy with his own students. So, Krishna, by the age of 10, went back to Dwarka, went back to Mathura. So, both of them took up responsibilities very early. That is, the responsibility very early means that both of them, Krishna, Krishna took up the Kshatriya responsibility of bringing down Kamsa and protecting the Yadus. And uh, Nimai took up the responsibility of of a Brahmanical duty of teaching. One another major difference is that not only are they both of them in different varanas, we have that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that with Krishna Balaram was always there. That Balaram was there with him before in Vrindavan and then he came with him to Mathura and then he came to Dwarka also. But however, for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his brother, he was known as Vishwarup. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was Vishwambhar. So, Vishwarup, he took sannyas when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very young. And then, later on, so it is said that Vishwarup was not exactly a manifestation of Balram, it is Tyanan Prabhu's manifestation of Balram. But, Tyanan Prabhu came into his life later. So, around the age of when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was around 10, Vishwarup left took sannyas. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was around 20, he manifested his devotion. Approximately, these dates are variable depending on which commentary of Chaitanya, which uh, biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu we refer to. 
But during those 10 years, Nityanand Prabhu was just waiting. Nityanand Prabhu was much older than Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But he was just waiting, waiting, waiting. And the moment he came to know that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu started Harinam Sankirtan, immediately he came. So both of them were inseparable thereafter. The, uh, <coughs> beyond that, when both of them started their mission, so Krishna's mission was Paritranaya Sadhuna Vinasha Jadushkutam Dharma Samsthapana Arthaya Sambhavami Yuge Muge. The Lord, when, whenever the Lord descends, the Lord has a contextual mission and an eternal mission. The contextual mission is to establish dharma in the time when he has descended. And that dharma is established for some time, but the nature of the world is Sakale Nehamata Yogo Nashtaha Parantapa. And by the power of time, everything gets degraded. So Krishna establishes dharma and Yudhishthira becomes the king, after Yudhishthira Parikshit becomes the king, and after Parikshit departs, then Janmeja becomes, but then Kaliuga starts taking over. So even when the Lord descends and establishes dharma, that is not always going to be there forever. So that, that so there's a definitely it's important to establish dharma at that time. So there's a contextual purpose of the Lord, circumstantial purpose to establish dharma at that time. But the eternal purpose is to show the path of dharma for all time. So just as Krishna, he, because he was born in Kshatriya family, as a Kshatriya, his primary role was to remove the adharmic rulers. Krishna himself does not give a lot of philosophical instructions. Krishna focuses primarily on eliminating demons. And then he himself hears from the sages and he encourages others to hear from the sages by his example, by his actions. There are of course times, like in the when he speaks the Bhagavad Gita, where he acts as not just a Brahmana, but as the Guru of the Brahmanas, as the Lord of the Brahmanas. Namo Brahmanya Devaya. But Krishna does his Kshatriya Dharma of fighting against the demons and, and establishing Dharma thereby. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is, is also the Supreme Lord, but he has come as a Brahmana. And as a Brahmana, he doesn't use weapons. See, Kshatriyas use, Kshatriyas use Shastra. Brahmanas use Shastra. Shastra is scripture and Shastra is weapons. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's weapon for overcoming or dissipating illusion was to use the uh, to use scriptural knowledge. And he did not give elaborate scriptural knowledge, although he had that. Just as Krishna, wherever he went, he was victorious. No, nobody could defeat Krishna. Even although Krishna seemed to be like a little child, he defeated big big demons. And with whoever demon he fought, Krishna defeated all of them. Similarly, Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya describes how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was victorious in all directions, wherever he went. The south is as soon as Ch Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was like a small town. Now it was not a big, was a well-known town, but it was a small town. It's, as soon as he came out of Navadvip, the first thing that happened was in Jagannath Puri he met a great scholar, Sarovam Bhattacharya. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it was like his, after sannyas, uh, it is his first encounter and just completely transformed uh, Sarvam Bhattacharya. Not only defeat him, but he converted him. It's a great victory. And then he went to South India and there is an encounter with, with all the sampradayas described. You know, he went with Sri Vaishnavas and there was Gopal Bhatta Goswami and his father. Venkat Bhatta, who were transformed from Shri Vaishnavism to Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Then he went to Udupi and he met Madhava Vaishnavas. And there also he instructed them in the glory of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Then he went to North India and there he met Mayavadis. He went to Mayavadis in the heartland of Mayavad. Prabhupada said, Varanasi is the Vrindavan of the Mayavadis. It's like what Vrindavan is for devotees, Varanasi is for the Mayavadis. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went there and in their heartland he defeated Prakashan and Saraswati. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he spoke so brilliantly that after hearing him, Prakash and Anand Saraswati understood for the first time what was Prakash, what was Anand and what is Saraswati. He understood what is real knowledge, what is real bliss and what is the real blessing of Saraswati Devi, what is real illumination. So that was the great potency of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was victorious in scholarship wherever he went. Wherever he had scholarly encounters, he was victorious. But more than scholarship, 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu shared the ultimate conclusion of all scholarship. That is love for Krishna. Now whoever he met, whoever saw him, whoever he touched, they all were permeated with love for Krishna. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was also Digvijayi in terms of the way he traveled. Just as Krishna was victorious with Shastra, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was victorious with Shastra and with the Siddhanta of Shastra in establishing it through a through debate where required and through the surcharge of devotion wherever possible. And uh, the, I'll conclude with one last important example of the parallel between Gaurila and Krishna Lila. That is, both are characterized by, by the flavor of separation. Krishna was in Vrindavan and he was the life of the Vrajavasis. But Krishna left Vrindavan. He left Vrindavan to answer the call of duty. He has a Kshatriya, he had to leave because he had to fight against the demons. Similarly, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in Navadvip. Now, of course, Krishna had not been born in Vrindavan. He had come from Mathura to Vrindavan. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was born in Navadvip. But the principle is similar. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also left Navadvip. And the devotees went deep into immense separation. In the, and they were they drowned in an ocean of separation from Lord Chaitanya because they just couldn't live without him. In fact, some of the biographies of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they don't even describe Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's uh, depart, uh, departure from, uh, from Navadi. And Chaitanya 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 also does not describe Chaitanya Mahaprabhu san, taking sannyas very elaborately. Just, it's a cursory mention of it. So this is too traumatic for devotees to, to talk about. And that's why you know, when we worship the Lord, because the devotees never wanted to think of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as a sannyasi. So although we depict him as a sannyasi also, because he was a sannyasi for a major part of his life, but we don't show him, uh, we don't worship him as a sannyasi. We worship him in the mood he was in, in Navadvip. It's like Krishna also has weapons. Krishna has weapons and Krishna uses weapons. Krishna has Sudarshan Chakra, Krishna has his Sharangana, Dhanva, Gadadhara, he has, his, he has his mace, he has his bow. But when we worship Krishna, we worship him in the mood of Vrindavan, with the flute, with the peacock feather. Krishna doesn't enter into the Dwarka palace with the peacock feather. And, or, but if it is there, it's not a prominent, he has like majestic crowns. Not a simple crown made of uh, forest, forest remnants, forest paraphernalia. But so just as Krishna, so the, just as both of them left the place where they were the most loved, and both of them are eternally cherished and remembered and worshipped in the mood of that place. Now, why did they live? Again, circumstantially, there's a different reason. Krishna had to fight against the demons. Krishna was obligated by the request of the Yadus. So similarly, there's a circumstantial reason that. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was cursed by a Brahmana that he could not enjoy family life. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also had to establish dharma. And for, establish, for establishing the Yuga Dharma, he had to travel across the world. And as a Grahastha, he could not travel. That's why he took sannyas. But ultimately, it was primarily to elevate the devotion of his devotees to an even higher level. That separation does to love what wind does to fire. Separation does to love, what wind does to fire. That when the fire is small, the wind extinguishes the fire. But when the fire is large, the wind spreads the fire. So similarly, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu separate, was separated from his devotees, and Krishna was separated from, was separated from his devotees, because his devotees had such great devotion that it spread more and more and more. And uh, in that way, he actually took his devotees to a far greater level of ecstasy. And there's a beautiful, I'll conclude, there's a beautiful verse of, uh, in the 11th canto, which Vishwanath Thakur explains, it refers to all the three avatars, Ram, Krishna and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And that also gives some parallels. So, Tyaktva Sudhustyajya Surepsitara Jalakshmim Dharmishta Arya Vachasaya Dagadaranyam Maya Mrugam Daita Epsitaman Vadhavad Vande Mahapurushate Charanaravindam 
வந்தே மகாபுருஷத்தை சரணாரவிந்தம் ஐ ஆஃபர் மை ஒபேசன்ஸ் டு தேட் கிரேட் பர்சன் ஸோ ஹூ இஸ் தேட் கிரேட் பர்சன் ஸோ திஸ் வேர்ஸ் ரெஃபர்ஸ் டு ஆல் த த்ரீ ஆஃப் தாஸ் இட் இஸ் கிரைட் So let's see what is the meaning. Tektva sudustyajya surep sitara jilakshmim That which is very difficult to give up the, the, the great fortune which is aspired for even by the gods that this great person gave it up. Tektva sudustyajya surep sitara jilakshmim Why did he give it up? Dharmisht arya vachasa yadaga dharanyam Because he very, was very devoted to dharma and to honor the word of arya of a respectable person yadaga ranyam he went to the forest and maya mrugam daita ipsitam anvadhavad that he became that he started he started chasing after a mruga after a deer who was illusory considering it very dear he started chasing after that deer and to that great lord i offer my obeisances so at one level whom does it refer to who chased after a illusory deer ram so ram left ayodhya which is very prosperous and even the gods were amazed with the prosperity he left ayodhya because to honor the word of his father and went to the forest chitrakoot and nandagavan and then he chased after uh, the deer in order to get it for his dearly beloved sita so that's referring to ram but he says it can also refer to krishna he was born in mathura and mathura was extremely prosperous but krishna gave up mathura to go to vrindavan by aryavachasa dharmishta dharmishta aryavachasa that vasudev had promised to kamsa that if i have any sons if I, whatever children i have i'll give to you so what he did he did give a child he gave his oh, he gave that girl that was born to ananda maharaj so because krishna had to be protected so if krishna had been kept over there so they would have been obligated to give him but because of that he didn't give him he went away from there dharmisht aryavachasa yadaga daranyam and he went to the aranya of vrindavan and chakravarti pad beautifully says over here in sanskrit the words can be reversed and the meaning still can be retained not the same meaning but a meaning can be retained less like in poetry you can reverse word order in english also So he says Krishna Maya Murugam Daita Ipsita Man Vadhavad. What does this mean? He says Krishna became a Muruga in the hands of Yoga Maya, that is Radharani. And when Radharani went away from him, Krishna ran after her to pacify her, to placate her, to win her over. Daita Ya Ipsita Man Vadhavad. So he becomes like a deer, and that is the great love of Shrimati Radharani that she can make the Supreme Lord dance like a deer. and lastly he says that this is also applies to chaitanya mahaprabhu that navadvip was filled with opulence opulence of brahmanical opulence not great wealth but there was great learning a very pious atmosphere was there taktva sudustej surep sitaraj lakshmim that from such an atmosphere to leave was not easy because everything that was there he was he had his mother he had his wife he had prestige he had respect he had followers but he gave it all up atyaktva sudistaj surep sitara jilakshmi dharmishtarya vachasa he why did he give it up because his brahmana had cursed him and he was dharmishta he wanted to follow the dharma and aga daranyam he went to the forest where which forest did he go to he says that he there is this is a bhava aranya the forest of material existence that is described in the fifth canto of shrimad bhagavatam so he went to all the places in the world where people were not so closely connected with god people were impious or only pious but not spiritual he went into that forest of material existence and he says maya murgam daitaya ipsitaman vadhavad here he gives a beautiful twist to that he says that the conditioned souls are like mruga are like deer and they are chasing after maya they are chasing after the illusory sense objects of the world so the soul is chasing after the sense objects chasing after maya and chaitanya mahaprabhu chases after that soul maya murugam daitaya ipsitaman vadhavad he ran faster than them to catch them and give them krishna's mercy ashila prabhupada jetej parivraja kacharya he traveled not just he ran but he ran in jumbo jet planes 
going across the world, giving Lord Chaitanya's mercy to everyone, giving Lord Krishna's mercy to everyone. So ultimately, the supreme parallel between both of them is, both of them are compassionate. Both of them are here to deliver us. And they deliver us by giving us the opportunity to absorb ourselves in them, in their pastimes, in their purpose. So if so the festival of the appearance of Lord Chaitanya, which is celebrated today, Jagannath Mishra Mahotsa, the mood of that is that just as Jagannath, the Lord appeared in the house of Jagannath Mishra, that may the Lord appear in our hearts also. And He will appear in our hearts when we strive to remember Him, when we strive to make Him the default object of our consciousness, the foremost object of our consciousness. And when, we, when our consciousness becomes absorbed in Him, that is the supreme protection of life. So I'll summarize. I spoke on the theme of the protection, uh, parallels between God Lila and Krishna Lila. Before that I took this verse and I said that how Atma Tulya refers not that the Dwarkavas, Dwarka warriors are equal to Krishna in all respects, but they are equal in terms of protecting Dwarka. Dwarka had lots of opulence, including great warriors. And we looked at cultural context to understand the Bhogavati and Nagaloka. That the purpose of the metaphor, if you, if you, can't, if you don't know the metaphorical comparison point, it may not be easy to understand. But the point is to protect. And then you talk, what, what is the Lord's protection ultimately? He, if a person is driving a car, the car itself will be insured. But more important than protecting the car is protecting the person driving the car. Similarly, the body is like a vehicle for us. So protecting the body is important, but from Krishna's purpose, protecting the occupant of the body. The soul is most important. And a soul's protection means protection of the consciousness of the soul. And Krishna provides us protection. So, and as per his contextual dharma, when he descends, he may even protect the body of the people who were there at that time. But his ultimate gift is that he gives us wonderful pastimes to relish, by which by absorbing ourselves in which we, our consciousness can always be protected. And then we talked about the similarities between Gaur Lila and Krishna Lila, how there was trauma before their appearance uh, that indicate that for the Lord to manifest in our heart, there will always be some trauma which we have to go through. And then we talked about how both of them are mischievous, both of them at a very young age took up their responsibility, the Brahmana Kshatriya. Both of them were victorious wherever they went. Krishna in terms of warfare and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in terms of intellectual warfare. And then ultimately, both of them bless their devotees by being separated from them because they gave them the highest ecstasy of devotion in separation. And I talked about how Vishwanath Chakrakur gives this beautiful shloka to demonstrate uh, uh, that this is, both of them are compassionate. And for us, just as Jan Jagannath Mishra's festival, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared in the house of Nimai of Jagannath Mishra. So we pray that the Lord appear in our heart and make our heart his home. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Granthra Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Gaur Premanande.